I grew up in the mid-2000s. At age 6, late at night, I came across a program that I never knew about called Adult Swim. My parents were asleep at this time, and being the little shit I was at the time, I decided to just watch it without their permission and see what it was. Ignoring the amount of series that I just couldn't make heads or tails of in later years, the first show that I was introduced to that opened my eyes to a new world of animation was a 2003 adaptation of Full Metal Alchemist. I must have come in midway during its run because the first episode I saw was episode 17, which just concentrated on the aftermath of the Scar Encounter, which at the time I didn't know anything about. It wasn't anything spectacular, honestly, I didn't think much about the episode. The opening was kick-ass though, and to this day it's one of my favorite openings. The next day when I told my friends about seeing it, they were... honestly insulted. They were fans of the series, and they were talking about how the anime is honestly awesome and that it was action-packed and funny, but they didn't like that I didn't enjoy it that much, to which one of my friends just said, just start over from the beginning. You'll see what we mean. So I rented the first volume and gave it a watch, and... Man. They were right. <laughs> but on that night, I learned the value of some things can't be measured on a simple scale. <laughs> this opening scene from then on was burned into my memories. It was like nothing I had ever seen. When I think about a dark or sad moment in animation from this point in time as a kid, watching this opening scene accompanied with the horrific scream after the cut to black was something that I would never, and still 16 years later, have not forgotten about. Cut to present day. A number of times, either on reaction channels or newfound acquaintances, people will say that they should watch the reboot FMA Brotherhood, because it's closely related to the manga, and as such, it's much more faithful compared to the 2003 adaptation. And while I agree that Brotherhood as a whole is quite a memorable experience, it does make me sad that people nowadays neglect the 2003 adaptation simply because it straight away from the manga and made its own original story, concluding with a film later on. There's actually a video that goes more into detail about both adaptations that I'll leave a link in the description below for people to check out, which actually inspired me to talk about this adaptation. And honestly, it's a damn shame how many people are quick to neglect the series. Rewatching it years later, I could definitely tell that Studio Bones and the people behind the adaptation really cared about Hiromu Arakawa's work. The story, the characters, the development, the music, and yes, the animation all definitely show that the people behind this series wanted to give their all for it. And looking back at how it was paced, I think that it was evident that they knew that this adaptation wouldn't have been able to let the manga finish without dragging out the show for as long as possible. Instead, we got an original story and some really interesting choices out of that, while well, some definitely kinda push the boundary of believability, many others definitely feel surreal and ingenious. And don't get me wrong, Brotherhood's story definitely has a lot going for it, and there's nothing wrong with what it has, really. But I think a lot of people already caught on to that by now. It's hard nowadays to mention Full Metal Alchemist without many people thinking you're talking about Brotherhood instead of its O3 counterpart. I hear so many people year after year comparing the two when personally, I think both of them are in leagues of their own. Both of them have time, effort, love, and care put into them. O3 for the creativity of its original story and depth of the original and even pre-existing characters, and Brotherhood for its faithfulness to Arakawa's finished series. Either route you go, you're both gaining and missing out on a timeless experience. Unless you're like me and willing to watch and enjoy both for what they are, which... You know what, props to you man. Or woman. We don't have the luxury of discrimination here. Either way, if that's how you want to take these adaptations, that alone makes me happy to hear. So, while I talk more about the O3 adaptation, just let me clarify. I'll be trying my best not to compare this to Brotherhood. Both of them go down different routes entirely, and it wouldn't be right to do so. If I feel the need to, I will, but otherwise, I will be talking specifically about 2003's Full Metal Alchemist. Full Metal Alchemist was Studio Bones' first attempt at adapting Hiromu Arakawa's work. I want to talk about the visuals first. As it being from the early 2000s, it has a sort of gag series aesthetic at times with the comical moments. But interestingly enough, it's very minimal with it at times. A shift of expression, the way a scene is shot, the movement of the characters, it ultimately never breaks away from the consistent animation style too much. Call me a relic, but I actually have a soft spot for the style of animation. Brotherhood's animation isn't bad, not in any right, but at times it does seem like an animated page is straight from the manga with its comical moments. 
That's the thing though, with an adaptation there are going to have to be changes, and there are going to have to be alterations. The root word adapt has a number of different definitions, but they generally all get around to changing something. I'm not one for seeing every adaptation do exactly what the source material does, as opposed to seeing what it does differently and how well the differences work. Aside from comedy, animation is one of the main factors that is capable of both setting and keeping an atmosphere, as well as a tone. Full Metal Alchemist tone feels consistent throughout this. For example, take these two scenes via visuals alone, one from the episode House of the Weighing Family, and the other from the episode The Truth Behind the Truths. Without context, both of them, just from the visuals alone, at least to me, feel quiet and even sort of mature. Now watch both scenes with the audio. They said the auto mail would be ready in three days, and you've got nothing else to do until then. Go see it. I'll wait here. You're right. I'll be back in a while, I guess. But there's a chance we misread something. Maybe we got it wrong. I said I've had enough. But what if our code's wrong? Maybe that's not what it says. Or maybe we missed some key paragraph, like a loophole or something. Context aside, there's a bit of difference, isn't there? Both talk about serious subjects, but the first feels more of a minor event compared to the second, where it feels more of a major event. But the way the show's animated makes it hard at times to really understand everything just by looking at it. Which is definitely saying something, if I were to show you a series like Oron High School Host Club, another show animated by Studio Bones, you can tell pretty easily just from looking at it for the most part what's comical and what's more serious. The show's tone is like this for the majority, shifting from a more lighthearted atmosphere and a more sinister atmosphere at times. Animation aside, let's talk about music, because this music is pretty damn good. Unlike in Brotherhood, the composer for O3 adaptations is Oshima Michiru and Beethoven- Wait, what? Oh! I didn't know Beethoven was an anime fan. Hmm, learn something new every day. Anyway, the music for Full Metal Alchemist is really good. Surprisingly enough, there is more than one track for a specific purpose or a specific tone. In the same vein as Brotherhood, both soundtracks are very orchestral-centered. And while Brotherhood's soundtrack is very memorable, I mainly feel like it's a few specific tracks out of constant repetition. With O3, many tracks have a similar tone to others spread out throughout the series' run, giving more of a variety with its repetition. The voice acting... actually still holds up for the most part. In Brotherhood, while a number of actors and actresses came back to voice the same characters, not everybody did, such as the voice actor for Alphonse, originally Aaron Dismuke, and most notably, Scar. An auto may alarm. And that explains why my attacks didn't do the damage I expected. Most unusual. <laughs> In Brotherhood, they casted J. Michael Tatum as Scar, whereas in O3, he was played by, no joke, Damien Clark. Cell from Dragon Ball Z, among other roles he's played. They've destroyed our homes and massacred our people again and again, but they do not tire. They still just keep coming. If those wretched state alchemists are indeed still trying to hunt me down, then right now might be their only chance to succeed. Interestingly enough, while I find J. Michael Tatum's performance perfectly fine in Brotherhood, I actually think Damien Clark's performance feels a little more unexpected in terms of what the story needed. Scar in the story is an Ishvalan mass murderer who hunts down Stig Alchemist. If you were to ask me what does a character like that sound like, I'd definitely go for what Brotherhood was going for. But in 03, his voice doesn't give off that impression to me, which I actually feel works more in this character's favor. What is this? Why did you mark me so? This vile sign. What do you want me to do? It feels similar to Le Ebb Blaylock as King Bradley where his voice can seem fairly misleading to his character, a subtle kind of deception. Which is quite fitting for the show how it's very deceptive, both in its characters and story. And speaking of, let's talk about the characters and story. Now don't worry, I will be giving spoilers, but I'll let you all know ahead of time in case you want to actually give the show a look at. The story for the most part follows the source material, but interestingly enough, it incorporates what many would consider to be filler episodes as a part of the actual story and its telling such as the City of Water, a train hostage situation, a mining town, etc. And yeah, I've read the manga, but I'm saying as an adaptation, they didn't need to go out of the way to add all these side stories from the main plot, but they did. The whole story around Greed, which in the series is where the Elk Brothers get a better idea of what homunculi are, 
actually doesn't start reappearing until past the half point of the series run. But before that, I want to talk about some of the characters before we go too far into the story. First character I want to talk about is related to one of the most infamous moments of the series that has pretty much been joked to death about. Nina and Shaw Tucker and Full Metal Alchemist nowadays is something that a lot of people have been exposed to over the years going on multiple decades now. And if you haven't at least heard something about this, that's... Well, that's just actually pretty damn surprising. Minor spoilers if that's the case since this occurs so early on in the series. What's interesting about how Full Metal Alchemist handled this back then was that it took more than one episode to tell. And even then, the big reveal in the end doesn't happen until after the halfway point of the actual episode. The whole story is centered around Ed becoming a state alchemist, studying alchemy under the roof of Shao Tucker. From the moment the Elwer brothers meet Shao and Ian and Alexander, it's centered around not just the exam, but Ed and Al's relationship with all of them. On top of that, Ed has a birthday and they end up having to help deliver a baby. Throughout this time, Ed and Al spent so much time together with Nina and even started to see Shao Tucker as somewhat of a father figure. Alright, so I've been sort of trying to do my best to not compare this to Brotherhood, and even then I've been trying to be fair to both adaptations and see them for what each was going for. But this is where I have to start putting my foot down. How they handle Tucker making a talking chimera in 03 is actually a lot better compared to Brotherhood. In this, Tucker is shown being pressured into making another talking chimera, or having his livelihood being threatened to be taken away with his title as a state alchemist, potentially living on the streets and no longer capable of supporting his family. Even in the last scene with Tucker hugging her daughter, it's not really clear as to what he will really do as a response. I'm at the end of the line here, Nina. This line could have been taken different ways as an interpretation of him giving up and having his back against the wall. But instead, the end result was, of course, turning his own daughter into a chimera. In many respects, the card the series plays with Tucker being a reflection of Ed actually works. And with O3, that realization is much more prevalent with the later episodes. I'll come back to this in a bit, but ultimately, when I was talking about how this show is fairly deceptive, this is more along the lines of what I mean. Someone considered to be both a father and a father figure, and in reality being someone who sacrifices everything for the sake of an end paved with a blinding ambition. Another interesting character I want to talk about is Maria Ross, a character introduced during Ed and Al's research into the Philosopher's Stone. Now, Full Metal Alchemist actually gives her a pretty interesting role during this point, with her simply being a soldier at first that just considers Ed and Al to be nothing more than naive children, especially with a matter of Scar hunting down state alchemists. As time goes on, and she even learns the truth about the Philosopher's Stone along with Ed and Al, she begins to step into the role of a mother figure, telling them what they need to hear and even putting her life on the line to help Ed and Al. For the most part, a lot of the characters throughout this adaptation are done pretty well, and many of them are given a lot of time to concentrate on, as well as other characters that come back later in interesting ways. And now we've come to some of my favorite characters out of the series. This is going to be spoiler heavy, so... Fair warning. Rathen 03 is one of my favorite original characters out of the series. Not to mention that his inclusion, it also leads to the reveal about how a homunculus is created. Alchemists who break the taboo of human transmutation and fail create a homunculus as a result, in human beings that bear the images of the deceased. Even without going into details, you could probably imagine the possibilities that this idea is capable of going. And one of those possibilities is with the character Wrath a child homunculus capable of performing alchemy who used to be the unborn child of Izumi Curtis, Ed and Al's teacher. He also took Ed's arm and leg for himself in order to break out of the gate he was held in. Honestly, the way I take Wrath's character is the embodiment of the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and acceptance. While I'm not saying that was the intent, for me, there's too many factors that make it a coincidence. His naivete to the truth about everything being his denial. His hatred towards Izumi after realizing the truth, rejecting her, and even wanting to kill her being the anger. Him using Sloth, a homunculus bearing the image of Ed Nao's mother as his own, being the bargaining. And him losing not just Sloth in the end, but Ed, who you could say was like a stepbrother to him in a way. In a really fucked up and ethically questionable way, but a way nonetheless. And Izumi, the one person who despite understanding what he was in the end, and understanding that Wrath was the very thing she created, was unable to see him for anything other than her child, who would eventually pass on due to her condition, Wrath in isolation being the sadness, and in his last moments him fully expressing what he wants to do with his life, 
Even going so far as to say, I just want to go home where mommy is. In his final moments being the acceptance. I'm probably wrong about the five stations of grief, but even if I am, Ralph is still one of my favorite characters in the series. His development throughout the series up to the second to last act of the film Conqueror of Shambhala is really well done. Aside from all that, the homunculi such as Lust are actually really well written. Well, for the most part, but otherwise they're pretty good. The story for the most part is adapting the manga, but aside from a couple side stories here and there, the original story doesn't really kick in fully until the Elric brothers reunite with their teacher, which is also one of my favorite moments out of the adaptation. Yet another moment that I have to put my foot down on. The reunion between Ed, Al, and their teacher in Full Metal Alchemist is one of the best moments out of the series. I actually rewatched it for the sake of this video. I'm actually surprised of the bit of foreshadowing they include with Izumi finding out what happened to them after so long. Are you going to eat, Ed? Hmm? Uh, no thanks. Eat it now, Ed. Yes, ma'am. Same goes for you, Al. It's really tasty. No, that's okay. I'm full. <laughs> and besides that, when they admit what had happened to them, it's actually a shame Brotherhood just made it into a quick gag. The punishment Izumi gives them, leading up to a quiet conclusion of them hugging, all with almost no dialogue between either of them, is something that I truly appreciate out of the adaptation. It's one of the better moments out of the series. And then there's Greed. Most of this is really the last they take from the manga before they caught up, and ultimately this is where the story really takes its own and comes into play, especially with the weakness they came up with. The remains of the original humans who the homunculi were based off of is such an ingenious idea that with what they were going with, it's not that unbelievable. Not to mention, how greed is defeated? Seriously, people should talk more about this series. The show damn near had Ed becoming a murderer for the sake of blind ambition early on. And then they go out of their way to write this? It's a lot. Many people can say that it's out of Ed's character to kill, but his reaction to that realization? That's almost too in character in my book. Not to mention the animation for this fight. I mean, it's Studio Bone, so it goes without saying it's pretty damn good. Even nowadays, it still holds up. And then there's Sloth. Hello, Edward. My son, why didn't you bring me back to life? Okay. Normally, I like to be more composed when I try to make these videos and not get too emotional. But sweet Monica Kaname, this is one of the best characters in this fucking show! Don't you mean God? You worship your thing, I'll worship mine. The shutdown Ed has when he realizes Sloth was originally his mother is just both so heartbreaking and just so good! This level of twisted storytelling is something I love when done right! And last but not least, Dante. While admittingly compared to Father from Brotherhood, she's not the best mastermind in the series to me, it is in its own way interesting to have a character continue to cheat death via stealing young bodies. Not to mention her talk with Ed about equivalent exchange brings up something that Ed and Al have been contemplating since they started this journey. I'm not exactly too sure how I feel about her honestly, but I mean considering this is an original story, it is evident that they were trying their best. So I guess Dante isn't too terrible of a villain for this series. As for the story itself, some points I can really get behind, others I'm still trying to rack my brain around no matter how well they explain it. Like how the other side of the gate is our world and the world of FMA is a separate and or parallel one. Not to mention the film decides to take place in 1960s Germany. Not a bad thing, I guess. Just odd. So, um, cut away from the script for a bit. I actually not only rewatched Full Metal Alchemist, but the film Conqueror of Shambhala, and honestly now, I, I now I think I get it a little bit better. Eckhart actually is a better villain compared to Dante for me in the series. Like, she was a good mastermind, don't get me wrong, but Eckhart is better. Like, you can write her off as being this power-hungry bitch who goes insane and wants destruction of another race that she's afraid of, but interestingly enough, I actually think she's a parallel of Ed in this story. Ed saw the homunculi as nothing more than monsters bearing human appearances that make Ed have to fight for his life multiple times and develop a prejudice for them. Which makes sense considering his first real interaction with them was when they threatened to kill Alphonse and force him to commit mass murder. How he sees Wrath at first is a great example of this, like Wrath had absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the homunculi and he didn't even know what homunculi were until Envy came into the picture, but... 
Ed wasn't believing that in any way at first. It wasn't until Greed that his perception of them began to change since he saw them as immortal monsters, but now he sees them as monsters that bear the faces of past humans capable of dying. Even going so far as to dig up his own mother's grave and asking Zumi for her child remains to get the edge up on Sloth and Wrath. When in reality, all the homunculi wanted was to be human, personal agenda aside. It just so happened that the only way to achieve it to them was through genocide. It actually being said in 1960s Germany was actually a lot more understandable to me now. It shows Ed going against someone who with a simple goal in mind that shifted to having a prejudice for another kind and power to kill those same people. Similar to how he was before, but now after the events of the series and throughout the film, he's had to deal with being someone of a different kind, and it changed up his perception on the homunculi as, well, well, just people who are different, generally. It's, it, it's, it's a nice detail. Alright, back to the script. Then there's the whole cyborg thing. This is where I gotta give credit to Brotherhood for its side story they go full on in with in the last part. Army of Immortal Soldiers to actually, to me, is a lot more believable than a fully functional cyborg. Or hell, I would have been fine if they made him a chimera instead. Makes a lot of sense, and it's not stretching much of anything at all. But other stuff in the original story, I really do dig on. Like Ed transmuting his arm to different metals to keep Scar guessing. That's actually pretty genius. Bertha had also played with this idea during Northern Briggs and when Pride fought Ed. And then there's Marta's story, which is actually pretty good. Especially how she and the others who followed Greed plays into the main story. It makes a lot of sense, and it's definitely in line with the story as a whole. The original story may be significantly different than what Brotherhood went with, but all in all, it's worth looking at. The people who worked on this, I can definitely tell, put their all into it. The story has so much effort. Granted, it does have some things that are, again, stretching the amount of believability, but it never feels too much like an asshole or completely out of left field for the series. Too much, at least. Then there's also the movie, which is a direct continuation and finale to the O3 adaptation. It's also good, while I admit there are still things that stretch the amount of believability with this series, it doesn't change the fact that it's still good. Although, if we're talking about which is the better finale, I do have to say Brotherhood for me takes that spot. And yes, that is because of Ed and Winry. There's something rather complete, yet open about it all that just makes it all worth the journey. And yes, I'm talking about Edward and Winry here. You see what you did to her, Ed? You left her and now she's an alcoholic! That's on you! O3, on the other hand, it's not bad, but it could be better. Although that might be because I've seen both, so as its own thing... Yeah, it's not bad, but it could be better. Either way, both adaptations both have something to gain and something to lose in watching it, so... Either way, it's some rather interesting experiences. I know that Brotherhood will continue to be hailed as a timeless classic for years to come, and honestly, I'm fine with it. Nothing wrong with that. It's just a shame that I don't see more people giving O3 more attention simply because Brotherhood is more faithful by default. If you really think Studio Bones and the people behind it didn't care enough to treat Full Metal Alchemist with as much respect as possible, then I don't think it would have made much sense for them to animate the reboot. You can even tell just from the last opening of O3 and the first opening of Brotherhood. Okay, I'm on a level with you all here. This is actually more just me taking shots in the dark here, so take what I say with a grain of salt. <clears throat> on face value, the openings rewrite and again can both be simply seen as describing and setting the tones for each series. One more serious and harsher, and one a mixture of mystery, melancholy, and even a bit of comedy. But when I took into account what these openings were describing and a few factors like the story they were centered around in the lyrics, it starts to put a story together. The last opening to Full Metal Alchemist Rewrite is centered around the original story, a story intertwined with the manga is rewritten to both connect the stories and to tell the one they created in place of where the manga had yet to continue. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood's opening is titled again, centered around the story of the manga, but the story that was already adapted. The lyrics as well to me paint a message. This is just guesswork here, but the message I think they wanted to address, or at least a part of it, is something like, We cared for the work of Hiromu Arakawa, and we know that a lot of people, despite how it may have turned out, enjoyed the anime we adapted. We put a lot of time and effort into what we made back then. 
but we want to adapt it in full now that it's complete. We want to do this again. Is all of that true? I don't know, but I think there's some truth to it at least. I mean, why else would Studio Bones be responsible for both the original adaptation and the reboot? You look at a series like Hunter x Hunter, one that's had both an adaptation years ago and a reboot years later, done by two different studios, I don't think I'm too off the mark in this regard. Just a thought, though. But even if I'm completely wrong, it's interesting to think about. But regardless, I highly recommend anyone who hasn't yet to check out Full Metal Alchemist. I've already made it perfectly clear, I know it's not the same as Brotherhood, I know it goes down its own route. But considering that the actual story wasn't finished when this was in production, you can't blame anyone who worked on FMA 03 for at least trying. It's its own story, and one that should not, by any means, simply be brushed off because of it.